We're rolling, so... Uh, <laughs> That's the official sign? Yeah. So we are rolling. Yeah, I don't know. It's not, <laughs> I, I just know how to shoot with stills, man. This Hell is yeah. a new level of, uh, of the medium for me. Nice. This is your private archives? Yeah, yeah, it's just personal <laughs> use. <laughs> this will never um, be seen by strangers. It's only for you. Yeah, it's, it's not going out live. <laughs> <laughs> I just have this uh, weird fetish for comedians. Yeah, you know? yeah, I, get it. I get it. I got some weird shit at home too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like it's like my buddy like ended up uh, picking up and moving to Alberta, Canada. Oh, what a because, decision! Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, because of his uh, fiance dragging him over there. She's a dual citizenship. Okay. And it's a long story. He, he was dragged to Alberta, but uh, before he left, he gave me his key to his secret server. You know, oh, no. a stash box, which is all just these, uh, all these tapes, you know, oh, oh, video, no. yeah. So he's like, if anything happens to me... Burn this? Just, yeah, destroy yeah, it. Just, you know what to do. Here's a free can of gas and set this ablaze. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly, man. And so, so it's like, weird. It's the Epstein like, tapes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, uh, thanks for uh, doing this, Mike. Of course, uh, first man. iteration of Uncontaminated Sound uh, interview series. And, Hell yeah. Um, I'm, I'm always the early version of everything. I'm yeah, the guinea pig. Nice. Like, yeah. I was on Guys We Fucked on like their eighth episode <laughs> yeah, so right yeah. before they got popular. Cool, cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You want to be on the cusp <laughs> yeah, of so innovation. Somebody yeah. will be after me and they'll tip wow. the scales and this will be True. huge and then nobody will dig back into my episodes. <laughs> True, <It'll> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it would just be my personal use. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, man, it's just uh, really, like, the premise is just really um, to kind of coincide with my series, uh, still series on Katamian Sound, um, where, I, you know, just try to investigate, you know, performers, either musicians, comedians now, mm. and uh, really understand, try to understand what they do and capture, you know, the human side with the, the camera. And now, here, uh, I, I just trying to investigate why you got into comedy, man, and sure. what, why do you do what you do? So, I guess the first obvious question is why comedy? What got you started with comedy? Um, <clears throat> I mean, a, a self-hatred and a giant need for attention. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. mostly it, to be honest. I mean, yeah. it's, it's been that way since I was a kid. I had uh, I have an alcoholic dad and yeah. a, a depressed mom, so my entire childhood was tap dancing and trying to basically release tension and or cheer up parents that had a medical disability. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were just yeah. unable to be cheered. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, and I also, I played sports my entire life, so I didn't know that this was really a path. My Both my sisters are, like, actual artists. Like, oh, you know, wow. I, yeah. I talk about my dick mm. and, you know, and whatever on stage, so I don't necessarily consider what I do art. Yeah, But yeah. Uh, my sisters are piano, like, what is that called? The people that are good at it, young. <laughs> That's how, yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, yeah. I use my words for a living, and uh, I still savants. Think, like, savants. Yeah. There we go. Both yeah. of them are piano savants. They've been like fluently playing piano since they were three years old. Yeah. I have, you know, I had borderline music ability when I was a kid, but like, you know, I was I was the athlete. I was the kid that I, was, I excelled at sports and basketball and soccer and shit like that. Do you need me to stop? Oh, leave just there a bit. Oh. You think you're picking up the... Oh, cool. Just go, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I was... Uh, I, but I realized that uh, I took basketball into college even, and I realized that uh, right up until I got hurt, the majority of the reason why I loved it so much is because of crowd response. Yeah. And yeah. I was super flashy. I was, like, not efficient at all. I was Mr. Behind the Back, Mr. Like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. cutting people up, all that shit. I totally. loved to hear crowds just freak out, like, almost end one mixtape shit. Hmm. And so, uh, once I got hurt, I realized that uh, I've always been the funny idiot, and why not try to pursue that yeah. professionally? It's like, um, um, actually, during that time, like, growing up, did you ever have bouts of, like, depression as well? Oh, yeah. Yourself, yeah, internally? Sure. Because I've, been, I, I've had to deal with that shit myself, and yeah. my mother's had a battle with, like, bipolar and stuff, too, yeah. so. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's long been a thing in my family, yeah, yeah. and I hadn't learned about it until probably, like, maybe at this point 10 years ago yeah so you know because irish catholic family we're not ones to share oh same here so, you know i'm yeah. boston irish catholic but, so yeah we don't we don't talk right <laughs> they send you in the woods with you just a repress and drink and a hatchet and you have to come out a fully formed adult exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> so i uh you know instead of knowing i was depressed i just thought i might be gay like <laughs> you know it's like, oh, i'm just not living my full life essentially yeah um, yeah 
but yeah, I mean, I had that my my entire life, pretty much. Yeah. So what was the point? Was it in college, or where do you find the outlet for comedy? Like, where was the first time you actually stood up in front of an audience mm. and um, <clears throat> attempted the the craft? Um, well, of stand up, yeah, so yeah. probably like seventh grade. Oh, wow, so, you know, I, I love I know comics are like, man, I've been doing it since birth, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. I've been yeah. funny since birth, probably, yeah. But I, I actually tried stand up in seventh grade. My English teacher, Ms. Pitignano, mm -hmm. uh, she would let me every Friday in quiet study, which was the last period of the day, she would let me do like 20 minutes of stand up. Oh, for, cool, for the class, and mostly what that was was I was uh. I was quoting Dana Carvey's first special, the yeah. one where he did the whole O.J. Simpson chunk and he did all the music uh, musical numbers, and I was basically just, you know, copying what he did and doing stuff from Ace Ventura and all my favorite movies, and yeah, that was kind of the first bit. Yeah, yeah, it's um, but then so I've been a hack since day one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when did you like actually do you, like um, was it college then when did, you actually did like, did, like a venue a comedy club yeah, yeah I yeah. did uh, I did a handful of times when I was at Geneseo in upstate New York yeah we drove me and my buddies would uh, drunk drive to Rochester yeah and I would basically you know I did maybe five open mics at Comics Cafe yeah which has since been shut down for drug trafficking and tax oh, evasion yeah yeah, yeah. To, <laughs> which is perfect in terms of how to frame my career but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah I was in the yeah. in the middle of school and just uh, I tried it I didn't realize how lucky I was because in Rochester there's so little to do there were actual paying customers there yeah, yeah. now in New York when I when I really started it was just you know 17 furious comedians waiting for their turn to say shit yeah so open mics were far colder yeah <laughs> somehow than upstate mm. but yeah I mean it was uh, right away I knew I loved it I just yeah. uh, also loved drinking and doing the college stuff of course yeah, yeah. you know if uh yeah, I went to school in Miami, and okay. uh, you know, wrapping back actually into your last episode, you, you went to a wedding recently. Oh hell yeah! Down into Miami, dude. It, it's very hard to stay away from anything down there, yeah. particularly in college, man. So I was, well, I, mean, I went through uncut my uncut cocaine and good press pills. How do you get exactly? Away from that? No, so, it was like there was no like frat. So like everybody went to my apartment for partying. So I was hell partying yeah. like from Monday on, onwards to Sunday. It was Dang. just crazy, you know. I'm yeah. like, um. It, it was just so distracting. So it's like, uh, for me, uh, regarding like art and, and my craft, I knew I always knew I was creative, but it took me years of struggle within internally, and uh, and the battle with like a lot of booze and stuff. And yeah, yeah. Um, it took me. It was it wasn't until like a couple of years ago where I actually found the lens, and I, I picked up from Boston and moved to to New York and found uh, you know the lens and yeah, then. Yeah. Uh, I started doing this, and this is this is me now. So I'm like 34 now. So it's like it took me years of just you know struggling within <laughs> self, and then dealing with it, that Catholic, Irish Catholic kind of you can't talk about it. Nobody talks about family history or anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. But apparently, my mother's uh, parents, her father was an alcoholic. I didn't know that. He, they both died when she was younger, so I didn't even know her like that side of uh, my grandparents, so I only had my father's uh, grand uh, his parents alive until recently. So, um, so, so for me, it was like a constant evolution of self-discovery and understanding, you know, a battle with uh, identity yeah. and understanding that I'm an artist and like feeling comfortable with that. Sure. Was there a similar kind of like progression? Or I, I know you always knew you were funny, but yeah. did you, was there like a, a aha moment or like a moment where you're like I'm gonna take this serious as a, a, a profession yeah I think so I mean I think that happens every six months yeah <laughs> to be yeah. honest I have yeah. a new aha moment where I'm like oh I get it and then in three months I'll feel terrible about myself and then I'll kind of like you know recycle back to the point where I'm like oh I think I got it and then it'll go into the same thing so it's a constant battle within myself to like whether or not I think I'm good at this or worthy of this or mm. should continue to pursue it I have people that count on me now I have a baby yeah, I, yeah. you know I have, a, I have a wife I you know this is a this is a it's a daunting profession when people are relying on you to earn an income yeah, yeah. you know what I mean totally. and, and I'm proud of the fact that I'm able to do it now yeah. but I would say probably I mean not until like maybe right before my first album mm. where I really took it seriously I really was constructing an hour I was trying to like 
you know, I'm, and some of those bits I like look back at now and I'm like, I cringe a little bit, but I think that's part of the evolution, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you want to go back to your old work. You want to look back at it and be like, ooh, look what I thought was good. Yeah. Thank God that I've actually, it's kind of a nice benchmark where you're like, oh, I've grown. Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, exactly. Bad. You right. know, at the time I was like, man, this is, this is bad shit, dude. Yeah. And now I'm just like, <laughs> oh, that's horrible. Thank yeah. God. Thank God I think that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, yeah, it's like any anything you, you just like evolve and like mature yeah. in your work particularly you know you start with a concept and you you know keep on going with it and then it evolves over time yeah. with life events so it was like a, another kind of question i had was like how has your material changed when you with your newborn so i you mean know? even even with that i will say the the beginning of my comedy i was very much in the vein of like of like a jim norton or yeah. trying to be because yeah. jim is so goddamn good and like every you know the creep thing that he basically developed and, and started and then every other comic kind of snail shelled onto him and tried to figure out their own version of the creep or the sexual pervert or whatever the fuck yeah i was also doing that but it took me a while it actually took me my first manager's assistant who now works for comedy central mm -hmm. she was like hey man like you have this relationship and you have this story that you've been dating this woman since you were 10 years old you guys are about to get married now. yeah you should probably talk about that that's what makes you unique yeah, it's yeah. not like your other bullshit and your opinions on strip clubs or whatever you're trying to do. Yeah, it's what's actually happening in your life, and that, despite my, you know, best efforts to be like, no, I'm edgy, I'm gonna do this other thing. It's like, oh, I can actually speak from my own perspective and create something original out of something that is well worn. Which yeah, is, you know, relationships, babies, you know, my kid, like all this stuff. Like, it, so it's it's even difficult for me now because. Like I was, not, I, I never set out to be the comic that talks about his kids. Yeah. But now I want to be the comic that talks about my kid in a unique way to me. Yeah. So yeah. everything that I'm doing is now self-examining, where I'm talking about my kid, but I'm also now auditing my childhood in a way that I've never done before. Yeah. So all those things that I kind of suppressed and tried to move past, and then write about other stuff and, and be edgy and all that stuff, I'm now like digging through it because I'm like, no, this is this is the pain that I'm working through. Like, yeah. this is the stuff that I'm evolving at, you know, with as a person. And hopefully, with me being transparent about it, it actually helps my kid. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I'm going to be the first fucking dad in my family to talk to my kid. <laughs> That's the craziest yeah, thing, right? you know what I mean? It's like, hey, so, um, son, this is this is what I had to deal with. Yeah, and, this uh, is this is the mental illness our our family faces. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that I passed this on to It would have, like, helped me, too. You yes. know, it's like... But I, I think that's where the core of like successful, say comedy, uh, or any craft, but particularly comedy, where the audience can relate uh, if you humanize yourself yeah. and um, really, really talk about your life, and then pe you connect with the audience because we're all obviously just human. So then you just flip that and laugh at it because yeah. that's all you can do in life is laugh at it, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean that's it's funny because it's how I. It's how I approach every podcast that I've done. Yeah. I've been as open as humanly possible, which has actually left me open to some really hurtful criticism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, you know, people hear it and then they're like, oh, I'm going to use that and call you something horrible. And then, you know, I'm going to feel terrible for two weeks. But I approached podcasts like that. And then it kind of dawned on me where I'm like, oh, I, c I should construct my act that way. Hmm. Because it feels good to be able to share truth and, like, and, and honesty and being open. And it's like that's what I want I want to be communicative with people so the right type of people connect with it and then I can hopefully you know create some sort of community or, or a group of people that don't necessarily have everything in common but we have the the, the interest of sharing with other people our experience yeah it's like you know, like that just the beginning of time is you know or beginning of civilization in modern civilization it was the you know what bound us it started with the you know cave drawings but then it was the the storytelling yeah you know tribe to tribe the way you passed on things is through storytelling yeah yeah and i think comedy is just an another evolution of that um in a different format besides totally. storytelling but um it, it's a fascinating medium and that's why I'm, uh, i'm really well, interested it's still in evolving yeah it's, exactly especially with podcasts because you hear a lot of people now especially they're saying like comedy is outdated 
Like, yeah. stand up is bullshit. Nobody wants to watch somebody with their manicured horseshit just go over through a routine because yeah. it seems disconnected. Yeah. It seems like, you know, you're, do- you're doing something rote and it's not in the moment. And then you listen to a podcast and it's off the cuff and there's mistakes and there's huge surprise moments and it's funny and it's hurtful and it's all that mm. stuff. And people become obsessed with the honesty of it. And now the challenge is to take that and then create it in a well manicured hour. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So exactly. the idea for me is to be as open, honest, spontaneous as I can be on a podcast, but on stage now. Yeah. yeah. yeah so take that, yeah, openness, sponta- uh, spontaneity, and uh, yeah, take it on stage. Uh, I'm kind of interested. I had this conversation with Martin uh, Urbano a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, like probably a month or so, so ago, over coffee, and we just started chatting and uh, about what do you think the future of, like, how do you take comedy to the next level? Mm-hmm. You have podcasts right now, you have stand-up, uh, sitcoms, of course, Saturday Night Live, whatever, movies, but, like, what's another, I don't know, maybe this is more of a mental exercise, what, what would be another, like, say, ten years down the road, to, like, where do you see comedy going? Like, what could it be that would engage audiences more than just, say, stage and right. comic? Uh, or like podcast or listening, right. how can you really engage somebody else in comedy besides these already set mediums? I mean, now we're, we're giving so much away for free, yeah. eventually we're probably going to have to pay audience to come. <laughs> That's probably more or less the future of comedy, is incentive-based showing up. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, they tried it with VR a little bit. I know yeah. Axis has that show with Gotham where it's VR. I don't think it's necessarily perfected yet. I don't think the the access to virtual reality machines is nat- is is that high demand yet yeah, to, yeah. to facilitate like a real change yeah but i think maybe that like maybe like vr podcast where now you get to sit at the table with us yeah so you're like right next to me in a podcast it feels like you're a part of the conversation you might be able to like I, if there's a way to find the you know interaction between us where you know sure. it, well it could be like you know it would be you, like as a user, I could step into like, your realm and you, you'd be on shrooms or something. Like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> your hallucinations, you're like, oh, you know, well, or yeah. something like that. Well, that you know? could be also be a thing. Is like, you know, we're going to be chipped at some point. So if somebody puts a chip into our head and then you can just beam into our chip and yeah. then see the world through our eyes, that might be the new comedy. Oh, that would be, yeah. <laughs> it's scary, though, it's because it's horrifying. like. horrifying. I can't uh, believe I just said that. Yeah. <laughs> We, we, we're just programmed to laugh now. Yeah. Like, so it's like, yeah, th- that's the conundrum. It's like, wh- has comedy plateaued? And have we seen the legends already, you know, uh, come and go? And will there be new legends of comedy, kings of comedy, et cetera? I, I think there's going to be new legends, but it's going to be niche legends. Yeah, You yeah. know what I mean? It's going to be people that some people know as a legend, and then other people have never fucking heard of. True, yeah. The, the idea that, like, there there could be a Fryer or Carlin where it's, like, so sweeping and everybody knows who they are, yeah. those days might be gone. Mm. Be, but, like, I think that there is room for people to kind of, like, you know, ascend to a level that of greatness. I think that's completely possible. Oh, totally. Like, instead of, like, yeah, the Carlins and et cetera, everybody now, we're so, we have so much access to uh, tools to communicate our voice. Yeah. Any anybody, you know, with the interwebs and. Um, I mean, there's you, there's people like there's people that tell me that I'm their favorite comedian. Wow. Well, yeah. The majority of everyone that exists doesn't know who the fuck I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. the idea that I'm somebody's favorite comedian, I mean, it almost makes them mentally ill. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. But like, yeah. but that's crazy. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so I'm already quote unquote, or anybody else is quote unquote a legend to somebody specific. True. And then other people have no fucking clue who you are. Yeah. We're in the age of just, like, micro stars, you know? Like, yeah. people just follow spe- uh, specific kind of vloggers and, like, you know, podcast personalities. But then, like, the majority of the populace wouldn't even know who they were. Yeah, of course. You yeah. know? I mean, a lot of the YouTube people that, like, make so much money, I don't, I've never heard of. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just, it's just out of my, out of my scope. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. You know, influencers. You know, we're yeah. in an influencer age, but it's like, the hell, they actually do, right? Well, like, how comedy. do they actually turn a profit year or? Yeah. I don't even know what they do. It's like, our age. I had this discussion the other day, yesterday, with a 
it was in a gal- art gallery, and it's, um, we're like, you know, there's kids now. We're we're 34, or right? even you know, we at least grew up without Instagram and Facebook. Mm. But now kids are just no Instagram and Facebook yeah. or Snapchat and what whatever iterations. Yeah. So they need their phones. Like she was a professor I talked to yesterday. Um, she said her class had basically withdrawals if they try. She said put her, their phones away. Yeah. Like they've had to have their phones right here. Right, right. You just know, to know it's there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, like, so that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, they have a tether to Instagram so, even if they're not on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, how do you approach comedy in this day and age with that like society or younger generation, younger than us? Yeah, like that's I mean, so transfixed on this like artificial means of communication because it's not true humanity no it's it's um but i do think that <clears throat> with the not necessarily I, I don't know if i can call it censorship because it is it, it's independent companies that are dictating what they want on their platform that is completely up to them yeah and it's well within their rights yeah but a lot of those companies don't want certain material that i may do or other people may do that is a bit edgier or darker mm. or uh or just flat out crazy yeah. uh, to be on their platform so they push it off and there's going to be a market for that mm. so then my thought is that hopefully while there's people that uh, that can you know consume the content on podcasts and they hear that that's still out there they'll be driven to then go to the live show because mm. the live show is why I love comedy yeah. it's yeah. not posting shit on Instagram and getting a hundred thousand empty views where you feel good for about 30 seconds yeah. and then you move on to the next day of hating yourself you know the, the live performance the moment that that's the shit. Well, tell me more about that. Like, and that's what I'm really interested with the uncontaminated sound, mm-hmm. uh, with the still side of things. It's really capturing those moments yeah. prior to or post going on stage because that seems to me like a really fascinating uh, transition of like Mike Cannon just uh, being the dude Mike Cannon to the performer Mike Cannon. Sure. Is that a different transition for you or? How do you approach that? How do you approach going on stage, I guess? I think it used to be. Yeah. And I, the, the longer I do it and the more authentic I become yeah. on stage, which all of this feels douchey to say, but it's, it's within the context of the conversation and the light is making yeah. me have an epileptic oh. seizure. But uh, <laughs> No, it's good. Oh, yeah. uh, but um, it, I think the longer you do it and the more you feel yourself, the less of a change it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It used to feel like I was one guy and then I walked through a portal and I was on stage and I was trying to be somebody else, a heightened, better version of myself. And now it feels like I'm not there yet. I'm not 100% me on stage, but I'm I'm, I'm closing that gap. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. where I used to, I come from a sports background, like I said. Mm. So before I got on stage, I used to literally jump up and down get fired up just like I would before a basketball game. Mm. Now it's a little it's a little more calm. I can eat, I can have a conversation, I can kind of like almost lose myself a little bit and it helps because I'm an anxious person. Yeah. So waiting to go on stage and the anxiety and nerves that comes along with that, which I still experience at the same level I did when I first started, mm-hmm. it uh it, it that's that doesn't push me to a better performance. It just kind of like it locks me up a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. if I can kind of like make my surroundings more comfortable before a show, I feel like that translates to a better performance. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, yeah, initially, you have to create this persona, you know, stage persona, it seems like, but then, now that, like you said, it's, um, where life and you act kind of just converge, mm. it's just you. So yeah. you can just be yourself on stage, you don't have to kind of have this persona. Um, well, that's what's funny even about my material, is mm. like, You know, I I used to really, this is a weird way to say it, but like I used to really try to be funny. Yeah. Like I I would would write and and like, and and really write down like, and and come up with a metaphor or come up with a like very, uh, I don't know how better to put it, but like try. Mm. And now I find my writing, I'm like, I'm writing things that I've said when I was a kid, like, like just funny shit. Yeah. That is now resurfacing to my head where I'm like, oh, if I'm. If I'm just kind of myself and I'm letting it flow and, and, and getting into a more comfortable zone, being uh, being that, it leads to funnier shit. Yeah. It, 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 or at least more authentic in myself, you know? Yeah, it's like, the more you try at something, the more you fail. You know, it's like, the more, like, the, tr- the more you try to be funny, you're not going to be funny. 
Yeah. You know, but if like you naturally, quicksand. if you just, yeah, exactly. But if you just like be yourself, yeah. Um, no matter what, what I've noticed in arts or any other craft is, is be yourself and what you, you truly express, then, um, that's what it's more receptive to people. Yeah. Cause I never thought about any of this, you know, I just took the camera and started shooting yeah, yeah. and it was, uh, and people, it was, the, I would say universe, the energy was just kind of like. This is your thing, and I'm like, what, okay. What do you like better as a <clears throat> photographer? Do you like the end result where people see your work, or do you like the process of taking pictures? I like both, man. Yeah. Like, it's a totally different process. So, I don't. It's interesting, or it's an interesting question now because a lot of people, younger generation again, a digital age, in camera, of course, as well. It's a, the whole profession yeah. has changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, where most people don't even go to this side of things of printing. Right, right. That's a totally different craft. A lot of people don't know what an aperture is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they'll just use their phones. Everybody thinks they're a photographer now yeah. with the iPhone. And um, and they just upload on Instagram and whatever. But the whole craft of making an image and not just taking. So make, that term is used all over photography. And it's debatable, but you, so you really do craft an image, meaning composition, mm -hmm. thinking about lighting, shadow, uh, a visual language. Yeah. Um, and I that took, takes the skill. I, I took black and white photography in college. Oh, cool. Where we had to develop film yeah, in yeah. the dark room and stuff like that. Yeah. It's still one of the better art classes I've ever taken in my life yeah. because you, you think it's just point and shoot and then you print the pictures or you mm. hand them in and somebody else prints it and that's it. But it's a whole, there, there's, a, there's several different stages of the process where like, that developing stage, you get to crop it, you get to set the stage, you, you get to figure out how much cro contrast and you know light to put in it and stuff like that. It's it's really cool. Exactly, you know, it's like so you have the first aspect of going out in the field making the image, which I love too because I love going backstage and meeting all sorts of personalities like yourself. Yeah. Martin was awesome. Uh, uh, you know, Sinbad, Louis were, were oh, great. He, I mean, oh, he's funny, man. Cool like, I, I was lucky enough to have like 45 minutes backstage. Just he had his son back, just kind of recording his thing, yeah. and uh, he was just laughing. I want to meet that guy so bad. And he's Everything so he's great on, on stage. So like on stage, his stand up is mm -hmm. like I've only it, prior to last December. It was I've only seen him in, in films or you know, but it, it maybe on you know his uh, uh, YouTube clips of his stand up, but. In person, watching his stand-up routine, it was just, you, you know why, he is that's, so that's his bread and moment. butter. Yeah, he is exactly. so in the moment. He says, I mean, you know, he's one of those guys where he's just funny. Yeah. So he says he does a new hour like every single night. It doesn't, he doesn't have written material. It's all just, you know, kind of on the fly. Yeah. And I, I believe him. You yeah. know, I'm sure he has stuff in his back pocket that it's worked out bits and he's kind of rehearsed them to to know where to go. Yeah. But in terms of like just being in the moment, reacting to topics and kind of just going where he wants to go, that guy is like, he's one of a kind. Oh, yeah. Speaking of like family, he he loves to talk about his wife and it's just so yeah. real too. It's so funny. He makes it like everyday situations dealing with his wife, you know, you know, being married for 20 years and then he was divorced for a while, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and then they came but back. But then, yeah, together, came yeah. back because it's like, he, she was the only one that could deal with my shit, you know. Right, right. So it's like, yeah. but he, you know, the, the way he presents it and just talks about it and just like crafts it into joke, mm -hmm. but then it's like applies to everybody, you know, like, uh, you know, it's so real, but then it, it's so funny too. Yeah, so yeah. it's just, so you like his act. He just started talking about the locale, you know, like. I, I captured him in Peekskill, New York. So he was talking about Peekskill for a bit. Sure. And he just gets going. He gets on a flow and he just doesn't stop. Yeah, yeah. And it's, just, it's amazing to watch. That's awesome. Um, I mean, well, that's... So just to get back to, like, the internet stuff and, like, and what, what not necessarily changes, but what we can look forward to, is, like, that exchange, that interpersonal exchange, that moment and that stuff in that show, that can't happen digitally. Yeah. Like you can watch stuff and certainly be entertained by a YouTube clip, by a special, by all that stuff, but it loses a percentage of its funny because you're not in the room. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like so even if you're like you're watching Chappelle and you're like, This guy is the best ever, everything's perfectly constructed, he's so smart with what he's saying and he's like he's he's intentionally challenging and you kinda even if you fully get it, hmm. you're still not experiencing one hundred percent because you're not in the room. Yeah. So exactly. that that missing percentage hopefully 
you know, hopefully the, that that continues to be at a premium because you know we're we're losing touch physically as people. Oh, totally. So you know, my my hope is that live performance doesn't die. Oh, exactly, and that's, that's obviously it's my fucking job. <laughs> <laughs> true. true. Yeah. It, well, exactly, and that's what I've discovered uh, covering performances, live music, and comedy. It's like you have to be there. You don't get the energy from listening to iTunes anymore, or Spotify, yeah. or Pandora, or, or you know, a podcast. I, I don't get that. I don't get the essence of you listening to your podcast, you know? Yeah. It's like seeing you, talking to you in person, or, you know, seeing a live set, which I haven't yet, but I mean, yeah, just yeah. meeting you in person, I get the essence of you and the energy. And say, live performance, I hope, will never die, because that's something technology cannot add, is that energy. Right, right. It's that energy, in a special space, say like Arlene's or um, I like the Beacon room, Theater, so you know, in yeah. these historic places that have an aura. Mm -hmm. You just walk in, you're like, I mean, totally, whoa. The cellar. Like, yeah, that's why yeah. I shot my special at the Village Underground. Not, not only am I just super fortunate to be able to perform there, yeah. but that place, you, you feel it when you walk in. Like, I, I've, I, since I started working there, the Comedy Cellar in New York is probably the only comedy venue where people are like, it's like the 80s, man. Yeah. People are going because of comedy. Yeah. Like they're not just, oh, I'll see comedy in quotes. We'll, we'll go out. We'll have a good time. We just kind of stumbled in from the street. It's like what to do after walking around Times Square for, for yeah, a day. Yeah. Comedy Cellar, people are dressed up. They're there for the night. They went there intentionally. Mm. They're there to see great comedy. And you can feel that fucking vibe. Yeah. Man. The yeah. whole club is catered to the performer. Oh yeah, that's yeah. why the shows are so great. <clears throat> Everything is funneled to the performer to yeah. make sure that it's a, it's a great show, and that's why the Village Underground. The, the I mean, people that my friends who would like see me in Caroline, see me at New York Comedy Club, which are great venues. They they came there and they're like, man, there was like there's something different. There's yeah. something different about that place where like you just feel almost the ghosts of greatness. Yeah. Yeah, I know it well with like Fenway Park, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, before Yankee Stadium was, you know, tear down. Uh, right but now, I, you don't feel that yeah. at all. You feel that fucking rich, the yeah. poor shit. There's very <laughs> few Sweet. venues out there now, no matter what. Sports. Madison Square Garden, man. Exactly. You go to Madison Square yeah. Garden during a bumping Knicks game where they're not playing like a bumbling idiot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that place yeah. is special. Yeah, it's that aura mm -hmm. that once it's gone, you know, once it's you know corporate name will be on it yeah. you know you lose that energy you lose that history it's like the boston garden uh, you know now it's td garden it's right. no special there's no aura there it's not, it wasn't that real garden where yeah. bird played and like the historic celtics played you know right. you don't get that you don't you know but at least we have fenway park yeah. but i mean like they, they have not yeah <laughs> they have messed with it too much but it's getting I to the point. I do love that stadium. Though. Yeah. It, 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 you can kind of feel it. There's still areas where you can smoke cigarettes. It's so yeah, fun. yeah. I mean, yeah. Back when I was like boozing and smoking cigs, yeah. I, mean, I was just like <laughs> stumbling around that area being like, this is the best baseball game I've ever been to. Like, was, not watching it. I was lucky to see the Stones there in uh, oh, 05. Cool. Uh, you know, my buddy and I were just like, well, I think they. Uh, Maroon 5 opened up, so oh, we were like, yeah, oh, awful. It was like, awful. I'm like, why did the Stones select Maroon 5 to open up yeah, for him? They probably so were the just like, agent. They were, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we were just like pounding them back before going in. But yeah. it's like trippy to see a, a, a concert in Fenway Park. You have to still have the poles ready to go, right? right? Yeah. So it was like weird, but it was awesome. But cool. uh, kind of wrapping back to environment and space, it's like, yeah, you you have the Comedy Cellar. Uh, where else is like another special venue? New York uh, Comedy Club. Yeah, that's where yeah. I recorded my cool. first album. Yeah, that, that, I mean the, the new location on Fourth Street is really great. It's a bit bigger. It's modeled exactly after the original on Twenty Fourth. Yeah, but that Twenty Fourth Street, I think it's like maybe 90, 95 seats. Maybe, yeah, maybe I don't I don't really know, but it's so dense and packed, and people are right up in like right up on you. Nobody's missing anything. If, if somebody's talking, then another, another audience member is pissed yeah. because they're ruining the show for them. So it's like everybody is kind of, it's a cool. team effort to yeah. make a great show. Mm. And that it's like it, the term has been used before, but it's a kill box. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's so tight. Everything is so in the moment and right there. It is just smash, smash. Yeah. And you, the sound is like, especially as the comic, you can feel it yeah. hit you. You know, cool. it, it, it's, That's cool. it's a bit of a must give you wave. just like so much energy, like yeah, in that environment. I mean, my first, uh, <clears throat> the first show that I did for my album recording, the original one, I got it. Like I just got 
the set right there. Yeah. It was when most of the people from the podcast came out, when most of my friends and family came out, and it just so happened to be like, it was just magic energy. And I've had it. I've had even random Tuesdays like that there. Yeah. Where, oh, where cool. just people are fired That's up. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's really great. Yeah. Um, one second I ask you is, um, <clears throat> did you ever like play around with like improv? I know a lot of like comedians were in like improv groups and stuff like that. Or are you just not into that style? Or? I, I took a few improv classes, yeah. like, but like informal stuff, not mm. even, not UCB 101 or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. I just took like kind of random ones that my buddies were putting on and mm. I, 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 ex I liked it a little bit, but I, I found that uh, comedy wise, like I'm, I'm a good team player sports. Yeah. Comedy wise, I'm not in it. For yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just not like I can act and be totally fine setting people up that way mm. for different muscle, but comedy stand up, I like that it's almost like golf. Yeah. It, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you got to do it it's on your you. own. You yeah. live and die on your own mm. stroke. And it's like, I, I, I love that about it. So improv was was cool and fun to kind of come up with stuff in the moment but uh having to rely on somebody else uh, it's just not necessarily for me oh yeah no totally get it same with yeah. like my uh, pho photographic practice and um you know it's just like you know nobody else can execute your vision yeah you know like with particularly your art or cra your craft it's like somebody's gonna muddy it up yeah you know and that's why it's like it just uh you know, I'm just keeping it low budget here. It's just a handy cam. Yeah. I have a vision and super like artistic vision for this, you know, uh, added video. But when you add like too many people, everybody has an opinion and then your yeah. whole vision is just knocked off. So it's That's just- my special even, you know? I yeah. mean, I, would I have loved to shoot it with a network or a streaming service? Yeah, that'd be great to have that kind of money. But, yeah. you know, I went out and did it on my own with my, with my, should I call it a producing partner or with my buddy, Mike yeah. Lavin, who is oh, like cool. an incredibly, he's a photographer. He's also a filmmaker. Cool. And I've sat in on every single editing session because nobody can execute what I'm looking for. Not even a guy who I trust yeah. like I can. Exactly. I, I, I came up with the idea. I got the, uh, you know, some of the interstitial interviews that, uh, that are involved in it. I came up with the vision of what this thing was going to be, the venue, the story, everything around it. So what am I going to do it and then hand it off to somebody who didn't? Exactly. Exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. I've seen specials where I know guys that I respect, uh, guys and gals. That is a uh, over-encompassing term that is part of a patriarchal problem. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I've seen that where they're super funny and they're, they know their material, but they don't want to be involved in the editing process because they can't stand their voice or how they look or whatever. Mm. So they pass it off to people. And the product shows. It shows that they weren't involved yeah. all the way through. Yeah. So for me, I, I'm so OCD and, and, and like and controlling and you know, all these kind of negative things mm. that I need to be involved all the way through. I can't I can't pass it off to anybody else. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm similar too when it comes to you know you know, with photography it's like it's only you and the yeah. you know, the lens and then uh, right, imagine taking it and then yeah. saying to somebody else, hey, develop this. Exactly, exactly. And then, like, with Uncontaminated, it was my own series. You know, I created the, crafted the name and, like, honed the vision. You know, so nobody else is going to take that away from me. And then yeah, yeah. I'm adding new new elements and um, expand it to maybe a different level of media. But I don't envision anybody else getting involved, truly. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, but... Did you um, ever envision of, you know, some comedians are more, you know, camera, pr uh, uh, are lean towards the camera, I guess, like for films or, you sure. know, series, TV series. Uh, did you ever think of that, going that route, or is it like oh, yeah. stand up is your core? I mean, I'm, I do stand up. Yeah because that's what I can control yeah. and uh, I will not lose employment. It, it, it's yeah. completely up to me. Mm. While I'm also doing that, I am, you know, I'm auditioning, I'm, oh, I'm cool. acting, cool. I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to develop show ideas. Oh, I'm, nice. I'm unsuccessfully pitching my own TV show. I've oh, done cool. that a handful of times already. Okay. So all of these things are part of it, mm. but if I can just, it, it's stuff that nobody else sees, right? Yeah. So the only thing that I can control is the stand-up. So that's why I'm just continuously writing and trying to put out content because otherwise I'm just stagnant, doing that's nothing, true. waiting for somebody else to give me an opportunity. Yeah, right? true. Yeah. yeah. It's the um, same kind of mindset of where you have to just go out and create yeah. it. And, uh, like I, I acted yeah. in an indie movie oh, that cool. is 
never been seen. And, you know, I, I filmed my first sex scene like two weeks after I got married. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure the movie's like, gonna be on. There's the porno YouTube. out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, there's some stuff yeah. out there that uh, nobody's gonna want to see. Yeah. Uh, specifically, my wife. But um, yeah, you know, it, it, so I, I've done that. I've I've acted in sketch. I've written sketch. Oh, cool. I've done. I've done. You know. Uh, you know, with video blogging, all yeah, that yeah. stuff. Where podcasting, I'm I'm trying to be as well rounded as humanly possible. But mm. again, the only things that I can control: podcasts and stand up. So that's what people are seeing the most of. Because yeah. the other stuff is waiting on somebody else yeah. to say yes. And I, I think you kind of like me, where it's like I don't like to sit and wait. You know, like I, I like to do. I acts, fucking I refuse, you know? man. Yeah, I did it for too long. I'm I'm gonna be 11 years into stand up on oh, in wow. January, cool. right? So I if. I, I've waited. I've waited for the Comedy Central half hour. Didn't get it. I've yeah. waited for other opportunities. Didn't get it. So what am I going to is sit here with my thumb up my ass mm. just being like, I guess I'm not good enough and nobody gives me an opportunities. No, I'm going to fucking film my own yeah. shit and put out my own stuff and find yeah. other talented people that are looking to also put out their own stuff totally. because yeah. we have the tools. Yeah. We, have, we have cameras. We have sound. We have lights. You can do whatever the fuck you want. If you're not taking advantage of that, you're being a lazy piece of shit. I agree. I agree. Uh, there was like a particular question I had. Uh, I kind of just jotted down where was there for me? There was a recently or just like in the last couple of years. It's like I asked myself, is this worth it? Is it worth the pain and like the struggle at times? And I had this self doubt, you know, and it's like. Was it, has there been a moment recently where you're like, maybe I should do something else, or, yeah. or you just like, I'm just sticking the with the birth it. of my child. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. I mean, he's, uh, him and my wife have helped produce my best material. Yeah. They're both my muse, cool. right? Like, yeah. and, and my kid is just new here, so yeah. I can't imagine what's gonna come in the future. Oh no, yeah. That I think it's gonna be great, but with his birth and the responsibility and like tangible shit that comes along with that that you're that, that you have to take care of. Of course, doubt creeps in. Of yeah. course, you're going to be like, I'm doing this crazy self-centered thing for a living that like, you know, money flux is wild, right? I'm making money one month. I'm not making money the next. Yeah. You know, it, it, health insurance is this cost and that cost and, uh, you know, all these things to where it feels like, am I being a selfish piece of shit by yeah. continuing to pursue this career or am I just like sticking to my own thing and like, and, and pushing through and, and, and being an artist, you yeah. know, it, and, uh, I don't know. As long as I can do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So. Oh, that, that's actually where I was at, too. It was like, is this too self-serving, self selfish? or And it is. Yeah, yeah no, so it, it, I was it, like, it, it is. is. But, yeah, but uh, I was like, I, I don't... pieces of shit. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Irish pieces of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go back to the bottle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, right. And repress my, my emotions, you know? Yeah. Not express. No, that's um, fun when you can just drink and cry, and that's the only acceptable thing. Be a man and drink and yeah, yeah, right. just shut up. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Uh, but it, I, I reflect, it's like, I don't see myself doing anything else anymore like yeah. this this is me it's like the universe told me came to New York found a lens I've already had three shows you know one of my first show was in Chelsea that was only a few months after picking up the lens That's great. you know and then I started Uncontaminated Sound last year in April I thought of a name of like my archives and it was like Uncontaminated Sound and then you know last December I got into you know comedy with Louis Sinbad yeah, yeah. um Yourself, uh, Martin Urbano recently, um, Maz. Jabrani. Yeah, yeah Maz yeah. Jabrani. And uh, Kevin Allison as well, I, I oh. recently captured. So I'm getting into uh, you know, evolving from music to comedy, but I'm just fascinated with the process of the performer and why people continue to pursue you know, their craft, you know, yeah. even in this tough you know, culture where it's like we've diminished, we've kind of diminished true culture and art due to the interwebs. But on the other hand, we we have other ways to look at uh, you know our craft as well. So it's like it's a fascinating question of where uh, culture would see arts and crafts like uh, performing arts in the next ten years. You know. Yeah. Um, so I guess another question of mine was, um, <clears throat> where do you see your breath of work in the context of, you know, say cultural history and like, you know, 
I'm doing the academic approach yeah. of, say, 20 years. You know, like, well, I mean, <laughs> insignificant. Just, yeah, I, don't, like, I don't know. I don't know. It's a hard question. It's just, it's a question I just kind of pose to myself sure. just to put it in context of. Uh, I just, here, so I can't control that. Right? Yeah, yeah. As a comedian what I and, and a human being, hmm. what I'm trying to evolve into is somebody that only really focuses and cares about the things that I can control yeah because all that other shit what my what my work means to other people who's gonna mm. see it who's gonna who's gonna say I'm good all that stuff I, I can't control it and all it does is create anxiety sure yeah. right so yeah. my my search there's a great moment in the documentary comedian with Jerry mm. Seinfeld where he's like I think he just met Cosby which hasn't aged well but um, <laughs> he's talking about how like yeah. he's done with the show he's made all this money he's he's basically accomplished everything a human being could want when they set out to do this as a career but he continues to write he continues to perform because he doesn't know what it is but there he feels like there's something else out there he yeah. feels like there's something else left to discover and I feel that exact same thing and I think that thing is me yeah so you know Gary Shandling said that to him in the it, it's like two different pieces but comedian as a documentary and then comedians in cars he, Gary Shandling and Seinfeld were talking and Gary was talking about how the material is meaningless because the material itself is just a a conduit to express who you are authentically to the world mm. so if you feel like you can give away yourself and, and tell everybody who you are as a person and express that that like real nugget of who the fuck you are and you can get any bit of understanding from strangers that's the shit man yeah right, you know yeah. right there I mean I don't sure. leave, I, I have I have unconditional love at home mm. my son loves the shit out of me my wife loves the shit out of me and then for some reason I leave that <laughs> that nest that warm nest to go try to make strangers yeah. love me yeah yeah I mean there is no greater <laughs> mental illness and like weird shit that you could put your focus into but I think it has a lot more to do with like with uh, internal discovery and feeling okay with myself and also feeling a connection with people yeah because this is a lonely fucking world mm. you know especially with all the divisive shit going on in social media there's people clashing all you see is anger yeah all you yeah. see is fury people you know trying to get their but at the at the crux of it or at the you know real nugget of it it's people that are desperate for connection exactly and I am too exactly <laughs> and I find I mean if you step away from social media for a while and have a conversation in person with yeah. people on the opposite side of things whatever yeah. left right middle wherever it's just generally want the same things we're all human yeah we all want basic we have basic needs we are trying to fulfill and what social media has done, particularly in the more text-based social media, um, has really has divided us into this just you know, ne Neanderthal thinking, you know, of us versus them, you know, just two-sided. It's not all or nothing. Yeah. In reality, there's, it's much more complex. It's not just he's right, she's wrong. No, it's all you know, he yeah. he said she shit said uh, shit and. Um, it's more complex than that, and people don't re recognize the humanity, you know, right, yeah. the real humanity. Uh, you can just go by social media, yeah. and then you don't leave your house. Yeah. You expect that the streets are filled with fistfights, and oh, they are not. No, exactly, right? They're not. Nobody, you think yeah. there's, like, rebels out there, like, uh, you know, everywhere, yeah. like, saying, you know, uh, trying to t take control of the government, but it's really not. It's, you know, people just trying to, you know, live, uh, you know, their lives and of, find their you know, place exactly feel comfortable with themselves and, yeah and gain some sort of understanding from other people I mean I feel like people calm down quite a bit when they feel understood by anybody yeah and I I just now am starting to get that I yeah. feel understood by myself which is huge like, yeah I'm I'm starting to like kind of forgive myself a little bit for who I am and for you know the thoughts that I have and for uh, the self-hatred that I have and the stuff that I've gone through in my life and you know I'm appreciating the the other stuff where it's like you know I had a, I've had a tough family life and yeah it, and it's really combative and and it's split and it's divided and I don't talk to a majority of my family but the family that I do talk to my sisters my mother my son my my wife her family like 
that has created a comfortable environment for me to feel okay. Yeah. Whereas before, it was very like, my back's against the wall and I'm going to fucking fight my way out of this shit. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was, you know, and still am at points, but I am very reactionary and defensive and, and ready to like, you know, go at somebody where now I feel a, a bit more washed over with calm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I think it's this age where it's, it's like... Eve. Yeah, oh, true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, totally, right? It's yeah. like, I think right now, too, I'm kind of at that point of kind of reflection, not reacting the way I was with a lot of anger back in my 20s or teens, yeah. you know? And with that anger and, you know, self kind of built into myself, I, you know, I, I tried to drink that away. I sure. never did, you know? And uh, that never helped. No. But I mean, at like 34 now, it's like it kind of, and going through like lots of types of therapy and it's like, I do a lot of like, dance therapy movement based kind of okay. expression and um it's helped me like just to be like you know it's in the past i can't i can't control that you know yeah. and, uh, and that's not to say i don't have relapse uh, yeah I of have, course I have, yeah uh, i have crazy rage relapse yeah so i am a work in progress till the day i die yeah. it's just something that i'm going to continue to deal with yeah because i'm a fucking human being but it's the point of recognition though you recognize it still may happen, but at least you know it's there. It's yeah. not like initially when you're probably younger, when you just, it was reactionary, you, it, just like that, split yeah, yeah. second, it was anger, you know? Uh, now it's, at least you can reflect and meditate on that and yeah, yeah. say, I'm cognizant of the fact that I have to face this, yeah. but now you have those pieces in play, the wife, the, the yeah. child, and... Um, problem is unlike a lot of other people my relapses are recorded oh yeah yeah true <laughs> yeah so people are you gonna do a micro research like, yeah you're like, like oh, right. <laughs> yeah right. that's is that the goal the, my, yeah, the that's, micro that's when you reach authentic self yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's when you have a full meltdown on cocaine on the stage yeah the factory. well then you know you've made it yeah, you know yeah. it's like it's like if you don't die young you know there's yeah, no you, point you, in doing you this die thing. a hero or live long enough to be the villain yeah he should go out chris farley way like cocaine and hookers man right. michael richards would have been a hero had he just slipped and fall and broke his neck in yeah. season nine of seinfeld <laughs> true true <laughs> um well how are we looking on time by the way we are good i have oh, until cool. 5 30 oh cool my, uh, my wife has something. so i i guess um let's wrap it it's kind of like like what advice would you kind of pass along to your son like through all this journey, and you know, with the, you know, you know, dealing with the, you know, some booze and you know, drugs and all that, and anger and the family, like, and then also, would you allow him to pursue his own thing, or not allow, but like, would you say, say if he wanted to be a comic, would you be like, that's cool, or yeah, of course, yeah. I feel like it, people that say I would never let my kid be a comedian, it's like, oh, then you're a piece of shit. Yeah, because yeah. what you're allowed to strive for greatness, you're yeah. allowed to take a chance on yourself, but your kid's not. Yeah, fuck off. The whole thing, if you want to be great at anything, mm. it's hard as shit. Yeah. So if my kid wants to be a great uh, stockbroker, yeah, what yeah. If, it's still hard. You got to rise through, and you have to face a lot of rejection, and you have to, you know, it's a scummy industries are everywhere yeah it's not just common oh of course i, yeah. I mean you know i would i would give him all you know the advice i possibly could and tell him honestly and transparently about what what being a performer and what trying to make a make money doing you know art is uh but would i ever tell him not to no yeah i want him to be completely fulfilled and happy and 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 what i would love is if my kid isn't as hard on himself as I am on myself. Yeah. So I come from a long line of self-hating Irish people that are really mean to themselves because the father, their father was mean to them and the father before that was mean to their father. It's a long line of verbal abuse. Mm. If I could somehow cut that and be completely transparent with my son and allow him to absorb all the information that I have to offer and then tell him that it's okay to fail and it's okay to like, have negative thoughts, but try to rebound from that. And yeah. Kind to yourself. That's my entire goal as a father. Cool. Uh, you know, all I want is for him to be okay with who he is. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And um, I guess I can start crying. To end it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get a close in on the tear. <laughs> I mean, that was awesome, man. It's um, I think 
that's really that's that's really a great conversation and uh, thank you for your oh, time of course man thanks for having and, me yeah. and uh, i think we can wrap uh the recording uh,